A very warm welcome to the Basel FameLab edition. My name is Anna Katharina Ehlert and I am board member of REACH, Research Think Change. This is an idea hatchery and together we work towards a more science-friendly culture and towards a society in which politics, science and the rest of the society work together efficiently to solve challenges of today and tomorrow. Besides that, I'm working as a hematology application specialist in assay development. I'm super excited to watch today's Basel FameLab edition with all of you. FameLab is one of the biggest science competitions in the world, and it was founded by the British Council and is still being funded by them today. Its aim is to promote young communication talents um, from the natural sciences, maths, medicine and psychology from all over the world. The rules are very simple. Participants have to convince the jury and the crowd in a three-minute science slam. And they have to excel in this short talk in the three big C's. So it's content, clarity and charisma. Big three C's, important for the FameLab competition all over the world. Participants are not allowed to use anything but props on stage, so no audio, no slides. And at this point, I really want to thank Life Science Zurich as the main organizer um, that makes this all possible, FameLab Switzerland. And they do this in partnership with Bioscience Network Lausanne, Science Slam Basel Reach, and the Graduate Center of the University of Basel. And before we start, I really want to send huge praise to all the participants of today's Basel FameLab edition. It takes a lot of courage, skill and hard work to present scientific content in an entertaining, even funny, uh, yet totally accurate way. And it is such a worthwhile um, exercise because we really need scientists that are able and willing to com communicate to a broader audience. But now, I want to set the stage for the first performance. Hey there, I'm Carrie, and I'd like to share some news with you about the most beautiful thing on this planet, our biodiversity. The diversity that takes away our breath, that fills all of our colorful documentaries. But yes, also that biodiversity that struggles and that we worry about. So there's this urgent need for us to understand our biodiversity. In our working group, we investigate the process that creates diversity, which is speciation. So imagine we only had one or two species on this planet. How boring would that be, right? So thanks God there is speciation, this evolutionary process that makes one species to split up into two or even more new species. And then this can go on and on to shape our tree of life. But which factor determines whether a species remains the same or whether it splits up into new forms? Well, breaking news, one of these factors is personality, these behavioral differences that characterize each of us. And we share that with the rest of the animal kingdom. Also in animals, we find shy and curious and aggressive and social ones. But how does personality help create diversity? That's why we traveled all the way to Africa, to Lake Tanganyika, to study very special cichlid fish. Because these cichlid fish are outstandingly good in producing new species. They are so diverse, speciation is literally everywhere. So that's why we like to go visit them, because clearly these fish can tell us how speciation works. So we go there and study all these different fishy personalities. And what we find is that different personality types like to live in different areas of the lake. And that's key, because imagine, even if we started off with only a single species, <laughs> we have these personality types in there, and they do the job. For example, the curious ones would like to stay in the rocky, interesting habitat, where they have to explore a lot, but the not-so-curious ones, they would rather stay away from there and go to the open water. So, after a while, these two groups wouldn't meet anymore, because they live apart. They wouldn't mate with each other anymore. And this is exactly what we need to finally end up with two new species. So I find that pretty amazing. You guys might still ask, what the fuck is she interested in that? So, you know, our research won't result in the next corona vaccination. But there's different justifications to it. 
we can only protect what we understand. So let's understand our biodiversity in each and every detail. Let's understand the process that creates us, because only then will we be able to protect our stunning diversity also for next generations. Thank you. Hello. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about the one of the most important particles in our universe. That's the hadron. Wait, what? Yeah. So it's a very tiny fundamental particles we deal with in our subatomic group of the particle physics. We call the hadronic physics. So look around us. Uh, most of the matters we see in all our daily day life, uh, it's composed of two main hadrons, protons and neutrons. Aha. Uh -huh. We have heard about them. Yes. So. And hadronic physics is an important part in science where it's, um, we deal with the, the nature of the matter in all our universe, whatever matter it is, we, we, we study their nature and their masses. So this uh, hadrons is a composite particle uh, composed of three tiny particles, even elementary, which we, we named them as quarks. Well, this has nothing to do with the dairy products quarks. So these quarks are bound inside the hadron thanks to a strong nuclear force, just like two molecules are being attached to each other thanks to a weakly interacting van der Waals force. Now, this strong force, which is acting in, in between them, is responsible for two deep layers inside any matters, even with the, including the humans. Like, they, they are forming these hadrons out of these quarks, and even though they are forming the atomic nuclei out of these hadrons, protons, and neutrons. And we know, like, atomic nuclei is the backbone of any living or inanimate object. But now, if we talk about the mass of these guys, mm, they are not pretty much similar like the common composite particles. Let me give you an example. For example, this is a proton which is composed of three quarks, like one uh, down quark and two up quarks. And if we sum their masses, they are only contributing two to 3% of the mass of the proton. Wow, so what does this extra 97, 98% of the mass coming from? So that's coming from the strong interaction between them, acting between them, and its dynamical effects. Well, we know a little bit about it, uh, thanks to Einstein's famous energy mass equation, E equals MC square, that tells us that mass is a very secret storage facility for the energy. But we have to be more concrete. And for that, not only we study them, the hadron itself, but even their excited states. Mm, they can be excited for, for very easily, but for very short a time. Like those guys are decaying into the ground state within like 10 to the power minus 23, 24 seconds. Yeah, that's fast. So what we are doing, uh, the hadronic experimental facility all over the world, they are shooting one heavy target, nucleus target, like hydrogen, carbon, helium, whatever it is, with some photon beams or heavy ion beams, and boom. So they have some excited states like this for a very short time, and they study their mass and decays. And the more we do that, the more we'll be confident about how uh, they are decaying to the ground state, what are their mass composition uh, in the cross sections, we will be able to point out their peaks, and in the same way, we are confident that in the next few decades, we'll be able to shed some more light on this long-standing mass suspense of the physics and all the science. Thank you. Did you know your body fluids could help manage your cancer? Let me tell you how. Imagine you're a doctor and you have three patient consultations today. The first patient has a very slow-growing tumor that's responding well to therapy. Your second patient is in complete remission, but as a doctor, you know it's wise to keep an eye out for its relapse. And your third patient has a very aggressively during tumor that is not responding to the therapy that you had planned initially based on their tumor tissue analysis. Three different patients, three different needs, but there's one tool in your arsenal that could help ensure your patients are having their healthiest possible lives. Liquid biopsies. This is the analysis of your body fluids, like say your blood, your saliva, even your urine, for any signs of cancer. Little breadcrumbs left behind by Hansel and Gretel, if you will. Scientists around the world, including myself, are looking at these body fluids to see if there are any messages left behind from the cancer. You see, the cancer is a disease in the body where the cells are growing uncontrollably like weeds in your garden. Like we prune our garden of these weeds, the body tries to prune itself of these cancer cells but does not do a good job without external help. But when it's pruning itself, some cells die and the contents of these cells come outside. 
like the DNA and the RNA and the proteins even that are present inside these cells now are out in circulation. We can then look at these proteins, DNAs, molecular biomarkers basically using some advanced techniques. For example, we can look at the blood of these patients to see if we find any circulating tumor DNA that has come from the cancer and has mutations that tell us that this patient, patient number one for example, does not respond to therapy. Or we can look at circulating protein levels to see if there's an increase or a decrease in patient two that might indicate that their cancer has come back. Or we can even look to see if there is a rogue tumor cell that has left the primary organ and has metastasized and colonized a organ far away and this leads to the progression of tumor in patient number three. Irrespective of which patient it is, it will soon be possible thanks to research for patients to be closely monitored in clinic by just simply drawing their blood or even peeing into a cup. It's a promising possibility, isn't it? Although it is not the reality in clinics today, it could soon reach a clinic near you. And now you know how you can help manage your cancer with your body fluids. Two words, liquid biopsies. Hello everybody, I want to talk about genes today. Genes are this almost mystical piece of code that make up life, but very much like life itself, Genes can be complicated, complex, and as I will argue, cunning. The most cunning of them all is a class of genes called selfish genetic elements. These are genes that increase their own chance of being inherited while being evolutionarily harmful. The most famous example of this class of genes is a gene called maternal effect dominant embryonic arrest, which is quite a mouthful. The acronym Maternal Effect Dominant Embryonic Arrest stands for Medea, and very much like the Medea in Greek mythology, this gene makes sure to kill the offspring that has the wrong genome. <clears throat> so how does this work? Let me show you quickly with some tools that I stole from a two-year-old daughter. She did not like it very much. So usually, when we have a paternal and a maternal genome, what happens is that the odds of inheriting any specific gene or trait is about 50-50. But, in the case of Medea, our Greek mythology Medea, what she does is basically poisoning everything and also holding the antidote. So, uh, what happens is that all the offsprings that inherit the Medea gene can survive, while all the offspring that don't have the Medea gene die. So this is a pretty neat and cunning trick to get 100% inheritance. Now scientists can use the same principle to spread any gene or any trait that we are interested in through a whole population. We then talk about, uh, we then talk about it and call it a gene drive. So now how this works, and scientists are a bit more elaborate than that, what we usually do, we don't take a Medea gene, but we take a scissor, and what we do is we find a, a space, for example, here, the yellow, that doesn't exist in the genome that we want to continue to live on, and then we cut it. So we get rid of these genes. And therefore, we only spread the genetically modified genome that we want to spread to a population. This is currently being done in Florida, where scientists spread hundreds of millions of male mosquitoes that have this gene drive that kills female offspring. So why, why only the female? Because only the female mosquitoes are the ones that bite and transmit the malaria parasite. So this is a malaria prevention program. Now the idea is that they release this, this genetically modified mosquitoes up into the wild and they will mate with normal mosquitoes and all the offspring will only be, again, males that have this gene drive, thereby reducing the female population. So why did I tell you this? Is it because I hate mosquitoes? Yes, but also, I don't let my daughter play with scissors unsupervised. And I think when it comes to scientists and genetic scissors, neither should we. Thank you. So, when you start your PC and you hear the fans making loud noises, while in that moment you really need to focus on your essential job, isn't it annoying? 
The problem is that the PC cannot be overheated. We need to dissipate heat to maintain high computational power. And for future devices, this will be the challenge to overcome. In order to have more powerful computers at an affordable cost. So, how do we solve the heat dissipation problem? For example, we could combine an efficient heat hydrodynamic dissipation with the current microchip technology, so we can dissipate heat better and maintain high computational power. But what is it, heat hydrodynamic? Well, imagine if we were able to control heat just like we control water. This is the things that I'm working on. I'm working on heat hydrodynamic, where thermal energy flows like water. I am Giulio De Vito from the Nanophononic Group of Ilaria Zarto. Take as an example the tap water in your kitchen. When it is slightly open, the water moves smoothly and is transparent. But if you open it completely, the water is chaotic and not transparent anymore. Now, imagine the same mechanism, but with heat at very, very small scale. In the first case, we have heat hydrodynamic flow, where heat moves smoothly, where the latter case, it's our everyday life heat diffusion. Graphene is one material that has heat hydrodynamic diffusion. And in that regime, it presents the highest thermal conductivity point. So we may use it to um, diffuse heat better within the microchip, but it's very hard to characterize graphene because it's so small that it's not even visible at naked eye. Therefore, we are building a special device that is able to characterize graphene and find its optimal point of heat hydrodynamic. Okay, in case we succeed, how do we solve the heat dissipation problem? In the future, we could combine an efficient heat dissipation of graphene within the microchip. So we can cool down better the microchip and have more powerful laptop at an affordable cost. Thank you. Have you been to the dentist recently? I've been there. I had to take out my wisdom teeth. And you know what? My doctor gave me some antibiotics because of risk of inflammation. And this is happening actually worldwide. Because of the misuse and overuse of antibiotics, we have a crisis in resistance against bacteria. So there are more and more patients which, which develop multidrug resistance against bacteria, and we cannot give them any kind of medication anymore. So what should we do about this? Shall we just invent new antibiotics? Shall we use five antibiotics at the same time and see what is going to happen? Shall we disinfect everything? Oh, I don't know about that. So maybe we should just drink another glass of wine? Or maybe we should use the natural enemies of the bacteria. Huh, who are they? These are some nice viruses, so-called bacteriophages, bacter bacteria-eating viruses. So you've probably heard of some viruses recently, like there's one pretty famous right now, Corona. This is a virus which is specific to humans, actually to human cells. But there exist varieties of viruses. They are for any kind of organism. So we have viruses for plants, we have viruses for animals, we have viruses for mushrooms. So we also have viruses for bacteria. And virus is an organism, well, he can only enter in the cell if he has the right receptors. It's like entering a house. If you don't have the right keys, you won't get inside. So a virus, he enters the cell, he uses all the material that the bacteria has inside, lets the bacteria work for himself, multiplies, until the cell literally explodes and the virus spreads and attacks new cells. And he'll do that as long as there are cells. The moment there's no cells anymore, in other words, his host dies, the virus dies as well. And does the therapy exist? It actually does. It's called phage therapy. And it's based on the fact that we have a library of different viruses. We take this library, we take a sample of the patient, we fuse these two, we check which viruses re react to the patient, 
We extract them and we create a personalized phage cocktail for the patient. And the therapy, well, it got kind of forgotten because when it was discovered in 1920, it was also pretty at the same time when antibiotics got discovered. And it was also the time when the Second World War started. And in the West, we used and used antibiotics and we completely forgot about the phage therapy because East and West separated and we stopped investigating, but the East continued. So there's this therapy, it exists, but who is taking care of it? Who is looking that the right things are happening? Maybe let's drink another glass of wine. The soil, the earth, the dirt, the erde, the boden, la tierra, la pachamama is the most important factor that determines life on land. Pachamama, Mother Earth, goddess giver of life, is how the indigenous people from the Andes referred to that which is below our feet. Now then let's imagine we had a handful of healthy soil. And on top of it, there will be a dead creature or a dead plant. We refer to that as Jimmy. Now, the first thing that our eyes will be drawn to are the tiny little creatures that will come and feast on Jimmy. Beetles, ants, worms, flies, and many more would start decomposing, breaking down Jimmy into smaller pieces. But that's not the end. Then bacteria, armies of bacteria and other microbes would continue this process to break down Jimmy to even smaller, simpler compounds. Now then, that meal is not over yet. The next organism in the spotlight is a challenger of our imagination. It's a fungi, a mushroom, mycorrhizae. These organisms are extremely old, over 400 million years to be precise. They actually helped plants colonize the land. And they can be really big, but we cannot see them with our eyes. But one single gram of healthy soil can have up to 100 meters of mycelium, fungal filaments, or hyphae, that interconnect the minerals, organic matter, and living creatures in the soil. Back to Jimmy. The mycorrhizae will capture the tiny bits um, from Jimmy and elegantly transfer them to the plant roots. Plants would then do their business and create new organic matter. Jimmy would then be like the Terminator, back. Scientists like me get our hands dirty to understand these microbes and the fun guy so that we can team up with them to boost the production of food in a sustainable manner. Because we're changing the planet faster than we are understanding it. And it is our responsibility to make sure that Mother Earth continue functioning for all of us and for those who are yet to come. Merci beaucoup. If you ever bought something in the Swedish furniture store, which by the way is not sponsoring this talk, you would know that after opening the box you find a couple things. The parts, list of parts, a picture of how it looks and assembly instructions. Hopefully if you follow those assembly instructions you end up with something that looks like the thing in the picture. And funnily enough, this is often the way how we think about what cells do during the embryonic development when they are making the body. So we have the building block, the cells, and they of course need some instructions. Now I know what you are thinking, DNA, the book of life goes in there. Now we let the cells read the instructions and do their job, and hopefully you end up with an animal, in this case a duck, but who knows if you use different instructions, could be a platypus, could be a human. Why is it really so simple though? Let's take a better look at the DNA, our book of life. It's really long, but where are the instructions? I see just a list of parts. 
And we know how these parts are called. We call them genes that code for proteins, which essentially are accessories that the cells can choose to use or not. But that's not very helpful. Cells need to become different. They need to do it in a certain time. They need to move to build an animal. And nothing, none of that is in the DNA. Now, what do the cells do? They can use a similar trick that we would do in case we wanted to make a Mexican wave in a stadium. Just look at what your neighbor is doing. You don't need to know what everyone else is doing. Just jump when your neighbor jumps. Now, in cell speak, you don't jump when your neighbor changes his behavior. You change your behavior as well. You switch some genes on or off. So if you pick from the list of accessories. And that's how cells can become different in different times and ultimately build the embryo. And now, of course, these rules of the game are what we need to understand if we want to build artificial tissues and artificial organs. It's much more complicated than assembling a chair from a box, but I can guarantee it's much more interesting and fascinating story. To prevent heart failure, uh, patients uh, take drugs that lower cholesterol, they're called statins. And at this time, there's millions of uh, people around the world that take these drugs. However, many of them stop taking these drugs because they have muscle problems, like muscle pain. And to help these patients, we investigated the effects of these drugs on uh, certain muscle types. So I'll explain these muscle types. There's two main muscle types. There's the uh, strength muscles, which produce, <coughs> you produce high strength with short bursts of energy. I may show what this. Something like this, and produces, as you might see, as bubbles, a lot of energy, which is consumed for strength. And <coughs> well, on the other hand, uh, and yeah, it uses sugar to produce this uh, high explosive reaction, a lot of it in short time. But endurance muscles, on the other hand, uh, use small amount, need small amounts of energy at a low but constant rate. And if I fill the glass a bit more, you might see small bubbles being constantly produced. And what produces these bubbles are <coughs> uh, little engines within the muscle cells called mitochondria. And they produce energy uh, for the muscles to use at a slow but constant rate. And this is precisely what <coughs> statins damage in the muscle cells. They damage this uh, mitochondria and uh, to make a, a difference, strength muscles have low amounts of these engines or mitochondria and for this reason they are more sensitive to it. And <coughs> But on the other hand, if you have uh, the endurance muscles, they're more resistant to it because they have a lot of these engines and mitochondria and they can somehow mitigate or avoid the damage. And uh, what we would advise for the patients is before taking the treatment to uh, train themselves to have more endurance muscles, to do uh, a long, few long walks, a few hours of long walks um, during the week, and therefore, they would be more resilient to uh, damage of these drugs that lower cholesterol. I hope that you enjoyed these performances as much as I did. Now comes the most difficult part. And for this, I will hand over to the jury. They will have to decide who of the participants of today can continue to the final. There will be three people who have excelled in the three big C's, content, clarity, and charisma, that will be able to continue to the final. The jury consists of three people. The first one is Maria Hondele. She is an assistant professor of biochemistry at the Biocentrum here at the University of Basel, and she has recently been awarded an ERC grant. She studied preclinical medicine and biochemistry at the University of Regensburg and carried out her PhD at both the European Molecular Biology Lab in Heidelberg and the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. 
The second person is Rishkia Agarwal. She is a PhD student in the lab of Dr. Navarini at the University of Basel. She's working on developing organoids, so 3D cultures, 3D cell cultures, sorry, obtained from the skin epidermis. She has been associated with the Science Slam Basel Club and Fame Lab Basel since last year. And last but not least, Kuno Sommer. He is in the board of directors of Bachem Holding AG, Sunstar Holding AG, Polyphor AG, PDS, Pathology Data Systems AG, and Targimmune Therapeutics AG. A bunch of companies. Before that, he worked for Roche for a longer period of time in his last role as a member of the executive committee responsible for the flavors and fragrances division. From 2000 to 2006, he was CEO of Berna Biotech. And now let's switch to the jury meeting and let's see what they have decided. We are the jury for the semifinals in, of the Fame Lab in Basel. And we just were very excited to watch all the submissions and presentations for the 2021 edition. You made it very difficult to all of us. Congratulations to everybody. It was impressive to, to see you, to hear you, uh, the way you presented science in a, in a very, very clear way. Yeah, so, but we came to a decision. The winners of this year are Carolyn, Dubravka and Harini. Congratulations guys and all the best for the final. Thank <laughs> you.